Who are your heroes? When you're a physicist, it turns out this is an easy question to dodge. You say Einstein and everybody's happy. But it came up recently and for the first time in a while, I actually considered it. And what I discovered surprised me at first because while I revere many of the great physicists and scientific thinkers throughout history, my heroes aren't physicists. No, these two, Beethoven, and Miles Davis. But then it made sense because the moment that ultimately brought me to my heroes took place well before I had any interest in science. I was a kid, 12, 13, growing up in Michigan, and I remember we had a few bookcases packed full of old books that I loved to explore. And these are books, it turned out, that mostly belonged to my late mother, who passed away when I was six. She was a musician. She played the cello and the piano, and at the same time, had an affinity for science. She studied biology. And so while I never experienced much of this in my life, there, years later, through those books, Maybe I got to know her just a little better. And one day, a particular book jumped out. It was on music and emotions, about psychological studies documenting this impact. And so, of course, I love music, but I became fascinated that something so abstract, especially music without words, could affect us so deeply. And it's not just us. You can play our music, Bach, jazz, even to cows. And they're drawn to it. They love it. Look it up. But this wasn't my real discovery, because this came at the end of that book, where there was a list of all the pieces used in these studies and how it made people feel. And a few of the names there, the composers, were unfamiliar to me, but uh, for the most part, I had never really cared. And, but here, staring me in the face was why I should care, because why would something 200, 300 years old still elicit in people today such intense and intensely different emotions? So I had to experience this. And so from there, a new universe was open to me. Every name in these pages was a new world to explore, each work a new piece in the puzzle. Of course, it quickly brought me to Beethoven, eventually to Miles, but also to other areas of art. For fun, I got a literature degree while studying physics. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, and even today, constantly seeking that beautiful moment of discovery when you crack some work of art, whether it's a poem or a painting, and it reveals itself to you for the first time. So I want to share one such moment that I had with a piece by one of my heroes, not just any by Beethoven, but perhaps his most impenetrable and uncompromising. So written very near the end of his life, when completely deaf, his music takes on this otherworldly quality, mystical, elusive, but with the deepest emotions. It's called The Great Fugue, and it's written for a string quartet, four voices. So the universe that he creates in this piece begins with a bang, a chord played as loud as possible, from which these four voices begin to separate into a sequence of musical fragments, somehow related, and then silence. This is not how music begins, and it's only after you hear it that you realize what he's doing is giving you the building blocks for everything that comes later. And of course, the laws that govern what these four voices can do with these building blocks, the music, the rules of music that he had at the time. And so from these very basic ingredients, he then unleashes this fugue, where he does everything within his creative powers to transform, weave, clash, different incarnations of these fragments among the different voices. And he quickly builds a complexity that is so staggering that it becomes a beauty in itself. And then from this chaos, other beauties, structure and harmony emerge, only to be swallowed again. There's an extended period of haunting, quiet reflection where he's either pondering or revealing some great secret of the universe. And on it continues for a full 17, 18 minutes, one of the most incredible endings in a piece of music. But it's a piece that I encourage you to discover on your own. It's an overwhelming experience but one that offers no answers. It remains one of these enduring enigmas in all of music. And of course, one that I had to crack when I discovered it. So there I was a few years ago, naively grappling with this piece so complex that I had no business thinking I could understand it. I simply should not be able to. And there in these struggles though, it hit me. Yeah, this is physics. This is my physics. 
Of course, it's not exactly the same, but the experience at that moment was remarkably similar. And this is what I like to think Beethoven was doing, was giving us his musical impression of nature, where from all the ugliness and incomprehensibility that's around us, we also find great beauties and deep mysteries. His universe is our universe. It's my universe. And if the experience of his can give, give us such a response, then why couldn't the experience of my universe, physics, give something similar, but in its own way? And that's what I want to try to give to you now. So I'm very happy that I've been designated here a theoretical nuclear physicist, because I find there are a number of misconceptions that persist when people hear this term. This is not what most of us do. First and foremost, we are scientists, which means we're interested in unraveling how our universe works, and the object of our focus, the atomic nucleus, the tiny speck at the center of the atom. So if the atom were a basketball, the nucleus, a grain of sand, but containing all the mass of that basketball, more or less. It is the most complicated system in the quantum universe, and at the same time, an understanding of its impenetrable inner workings brings us face to face with some of nature's greatest mysteries. It's our own great fugue that we as scientists want to crack. But how can we? Well, first the good news, like with Beethoven, we know the building blocks of the nucleus, protons, neutrons. But where things get complicated is we don't know exactly how the fundamental forces in nature, of which there are four, they're the four voices in our fugue, how they come together to give us a complete picture of the nucleus that we can observe. If you think with me for a minute, consider our first fundamental force in nature, electromagnetism. What this tells us is that if protons are positive, then they'll repel each other. Then, if neutrons are neutral, and there's nothing else, nuclei should be flying apart. We and everything that we know should not exist. But we're here. So that means some, there's something else something stronger holding the nucleus together, and indeed there is. It's our second fundamental force in nature, which we creatively call the strong nuclear force. But this force turns out to be one of the dirtiest tricks that nature plays on us nuclear physicists, because while we understand very well how it holds together the smaller particles inside of a proton or inside of a neutron, we still can't calculate exactly how it's manifested between protons and neutrons themselves such that they bind together to form nuclei. But we physicists, we have our own tricks as well, and this is something we can deal with. But there's more, because we still would then need to confront the fact that nuclei contain tens, literally hundreds of protons and neutrons, all interacting at once with this incredibly complicated force. It's almost impossible to imagine, much less imagine we could make sense of it. We simply should not be able to. Because here, nature has given us a complexity so staggering that it's a beauty in itself. But, as you might think, nuclei are not pure chaos. Because just as in Beethoven's fugue, other beauties, structure and harmony emerge. Across thousands of nuclei, a few particular numbers stand out. Where, if a nucleus contains this many protons or neutrons, then it exhibits properties so fundamental to our understanding of the nucleus that we call these the magic numbers. So it doesn't matter what I have plotted here, or produced by a very famous physicist. You can see that across the thousands of points, something magic happens at these seven numbers. But what I'm showing you is textbook material. Because what we know now is that as laboratories across, across the world begin to produce what we call exotic nuclei, which are, exist very near the, the, the limits of, of where they can exist, that new magic numbers arise. And one of our central challenges is to explain and predict the, this new and unexpected emergence of structure from the chaos of the nucleus. And again, we physicists, we have our tricks. But it turns out nuclei keep even greater secrets. Because just as Beethoven's fugue reaches its deepest point in those quiet passages reflecting on the ineffable, through the nucleus, we confront it. Some of the most profound unanswered questions in science, nature. There are several, but there's one in particular that connects the infinitely small scale of the nucleus to unimaginably vast structures in our universe. And this is the mystery that we call dark matter. So now 
our scope changes to the cosmic galaxies. We all have some idea of what a galaxy looks like, some hurricane of stars rotating around some central black hole held together with our third fundamental force in nature, gravity, familiar one. But what astronomers noticed when they first started looking at the rotation of galaxies is that as you get further from the center, stars are rotating impossibly fast. That means that all the gravity from the matter that they can see in a galaxy is nowhere near enough to hold these stars in their orbits. Galaxies should be flying apart, but they're not which means there must be something else. And in particular, if there were some uniform halo of matter that we couldn't see engulfing a galaxy, this would keep the stars in their orbits. But this is only the first hint of something mysterious out there. There's more. Because what Einstein tells us is that any con concentration of matter will warp both the space and the time around it, such that, for instance, the path of light from some more distant source will be bent as if going through a lens. And from our understanding of this lensing effect, we can map the distribution of matter in the sky, whether we can see it or not. And when we then point our telescopes towards some of the most incredibly concentrated regions of matter in the universe, where collisions of clusters of galaxies takes place, just think about that, that happens. <laughs> that we see again something incredible. And that is, if we plot the distribution of matter that we can see with particular telescopes, here shown in the red region or pink, and contrast that with the distribution of matter that we infer from this lensing effect, here shown in the blue, they are nowhere near the same. And what this appears to be telling us is that there is a far, far greater amount of matter sitting there that we simply cannot see than the already tremendous amount that we know is there. And this is what we call dark matter. And by our best estimates, there is five times as much dark matter in the universe than all the stars, all the galaxies, all the everything that we can see with our telescopes, and we have no idea what it is. But now, as our fugue reaches its culmination, all our pieces come together, the answer might very well lie in the atomic nucleus because perhaps the best chance that we have to learn something about what dark matter is, is if one of these elusive particles in the halo engulfing our galaxy were to interact with a nucleus, and we were there to see it. But how would it interact? Well, this is with our fourth fundamental force in nature, which we call the weak nuclear force. Now, you'll be excused if you are unfamiliar with this, because its greatest claim to fame is probably governing a particular class of nuclear decays. Right. But <laughs> it's the only way that most of the leading candidates for dark matter would be able to interact with matter as we know it. And so then we would not only have to know how this interaction takes place, but how the nucleus itself would respond in order to interpret such an event were we to see it. So this tiny speck at the center of the atom very well could be the key to unlocking this great cosmic mystery. So it's an overwhelming prospect, but one that so far has given us no answers. None of these events have been observed. There might be nothing to observe at all because the answer might very well be that we don't understand gravity well enough. We don't know. But one thing is clear, that even now, our best tricks as physicists have so far fallen short on this problem. And like Beethoven's, our great fugue remains an enigma. But it's still one that I encourage you to explore more fully on your own. So I want to end with a quote. We know there's something there, but we don't know what it is. This isn't me talking about dark matter two minutes ago. This is a musician from Beethoven's time describing the music that he wrote at the end of his life. And I think it perfectly evokes both the, the spirit of potential discovery and emotional journey that can be had both in art and in physics. But it's a journey that we can only undertake if we initiate it ourselves. So just as you approach going to a concert or an art gallery or even reading a book in a particular way, why not take the same approach to physics to science, to take it not as some dull or even fun educational experience, but as an artistic or emotional one. There are plenty of opportunities 
public lectures, events like this, Triumph where I work, gives tours every day, or even talk to a physicist. We're mostly nice. There's even a few in the audience. <laughs> You'll probably be surprised by what we have to say. And if you struggle just enough, you too might experience that beautiful moment of discovery when you crack the art of physics and it reveals itself to you for the first time. And in that very same mo moment, you might even be surprised to discover that your next hero is a physicist. Thank you.